Next question. With the Chinese in Singapore forming more than 75% of the population, Colin, why do you think it's been difficult, especially over the last two decades, to attract the younger boys into playing the game professionally in Singapore? I think when I start playing football in the 70s, maybe 80s, early 80s, we really discuss about this problem. You know, how come the Chinese not coming to play? Um, recently, recent years, I think the family are getting smaller. Like myself, I got four children there. I look around, wow, Chinese family have four. You know, maximum two these days mm. is really quite difficult because the parents feel pressure. Um, Chinese parents normally we want our children to study, you know, academic, because in Singapore, this society practice on the left brain. You know, success mainly on the left brain. So everybody will go to that road. Mm. I feel that football itself is not an industry big enough to say, if I step into football, I will retire in football. Mm. We don't have this. I remember 1996, one of my kid men, uh, he got himself upgraded, mm. his O level, and got himself, took up physio course, and many other courses, he said, call that on the upgrade. I, I said, wow, I'm very impressed. I said, why? Because I want to retire in Singapore football mm. because it's a professional league. Mm. That's how we started. But it doesn't happen this way. So if you want Chinese family to, a Chinese children to come in, the parents to give them support, I think it have to be an industry. It have to be something that, where will my son end up to be? I mean, we have even a coach who won how many times coach of the year and he lost his job. Mm. You know, this is a scene that we have and we have to be very practical, very real. Uh, there's so many competitions, so many interesting jobs out there for them to choose. Mm. So is football able to lure them in, to give them a platform to say, I will retire in football after 25 years. Mm. It's going to be very tough. Mm. So in short, you're saying it's not a lucrative career. It's not. Sh uh, Shasi, we've seen some of our players currently earning more than $10,000 overseas plus a car, plus a house. Aren't those attracti attractive perks more than enough to lure more Chinese, more Indians, more Eurasians to embark on a pro football career? And firstly, those players who are away, abroad, uh, done well, right? Mm. Few and far between, number one. And uh, number two, you look at what uh, what's happening with the Warriors. Yeah, Warriors FC. So players are thinking. Mm. Players are, why should I be doing this? Mm. You know, it's 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 scary out there, mm. right? So why should I be? Uh, and obviously Bernard has said, use these as a stepping stone to get out there, mm. right? And 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 which is which is great. Okay, this is a if you want to call it the developmental league to. To, to be a foundation, as a stepping stone to get out there. But this is the first stage, right? Mm. So you wanna put your foot in, your first step in. You wouldn't want to, you know? And, and again, I know from personal experience, not for me, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about knowing about players who are playing in the league right now, who are doing grab delivery, grab this, grab that, and everything, mm. you know? And they're doing extra jobs, why? You're not being paid well, not p being paid on time, all right, and again, it goes back to club problems, right? And again, it's not pointing fingers at this yeah. and, that and these guys and, and what, what have you. So, like I said, it's not lucrative enough. You know, you, you speak about all these players, this uh, Haris Harun and what have you. Mm. It's few and far between. And it's not only about talent, these guys. It's mm. about this. It's their mentality, their attitude has been absolutely brilliant. Yeah. You know, people mm. like Haris and all. And all. It's, it's, it's great. But again, few and far between. Okay. Mm. Uh, Bernard? Do you feel that perhaps over the last 30 years, mm. with a large number of uh, the Malays playing football in the SPL or featuring for the Lions, mm -hmm. perhaps some of the other racial groups feel out of place or maybe not given an equal chance, perhaps? What's your take? So, I have uh, received tremendous amount of comments that most Singaporeans actually do desire a national team. National team meaning to say that it reflects reflect our nation and yeah. that it means you know, multi-ethnic groups. 
Uh, in fact, I get so many people telling me that we actually succeeded so well when we had multiracial groups uh, from the 80s, 90s, and also they mentioned Eric Payne, they mm. mentioned Terry, they mentioned you know a whole bunch of people, right? And you really had a, a mixture of people. And I think there's something to be said about that. It is true, if we only rely on a pool of uh, players that 16%, 70% of our population, we are really foregoing the rest. So again, it's a very complex social problem. Why are the rest not, not, not stepping up? So one of the arguments is I've heard is obviously, you know, it's not a career. It's not a career. And so if they, you, you take that point of view, then we have to make it a career. Then my question is, how much will it take, right, for you to actually step up? So I've actually done this mental exercise, you know. I think, right, if I wanted uh, somebody to regard it as a career, I need to play a player something like $10,000 a month. Every SPL player? Yes. Because if he has a career over 10 years, that will make him around, that's about a million. He mm. will buy a HDB flat and pay it off, perhaps get a car, mm. and then he's got his whole life in front of him. Something like that. Mm. That's, that's my mental math. Then the question is, can we get there? <laughs> Because a footballer's playing career is very short. It's very yeah, short. After that. Can we get there, right? Yeah. Now, if of course you say that, no, the SPL is not your end goal, and we don't want it to be the end goal. Seriously, I mean, much, right? Mm. Some people were arguing to be commercially successful, our best players must be here. No other league in the world says that. <laughs> Belgium doesn't say that, mm. right? Mm. You want the players to play at the top leagues in the world, and we want to compete at an international level, that's our goal. We want our players to play in the top leagues in the world. We are very happy that Iksan's playing in Norway, right? Mm. It gives him, I mean, you can see the tremendous development he's made, even though he's playing in the second division. It's a tremendous amount of development. We want our best players to go up. Mm. So if you start to factor that in, then obviously it becomes a little bit more lucrative. But my argument would be this, right? If I said that the SPL was the be all and end all and paid to that extent, really that's not our goal. Now, the other thing I've also asked ourselves the question is do we really want people to come here and play for it just because of the money? Right? So I've asked the question, does Kwachamon take on swimming because of the money? No. Right? Yeah. Do some of the people do bowling? They do it because they have a skill. They want to see how far they can go. They love the sport. And you do it for a while. I'm not asking you to do it all the way to 35, you know. If at the age of 23, 24, you know you ain't going to make it, it's not too late to change. Who goes through this? Golfers go through this. You go through 17, 18, you try on the tour, right? 27 years old, right? Your father's bleeding money because he's sponsoring you. You decide time to be coaching or to do something different with my life. But you give it a shot, right? So I'd like to think that what we want to do is to give people a great shot, right? At chasing your dreams. And it's true, all I want, if we want to be a great national team, we want 11, 12 players to be playing in Europe in the future. Mm. That will definitely get us to the World Cup, right? The question is, how do we get to a system that gets there? Okay. Final two points that we're going to address for this, for this uh, first show of SG Sports Uncut for 2020. Mindsets. Colin, the privilege of donning the national jersey, like you said earlier, you know, hand on the heart, the values and significance of earning the right to put on a national kit. You compare and contrast the lifestyles of the past and present. You mix around with you know, all the dozens of uh, the local legends. What do they always tell you of the past when they competed to represent Singapore? What did it mean for them back then? I think it's good to look back at the past. But you know, you can't tell the new generation, you know, the past. Yeah. You know, we had to move forward. Yeah. But in the past, what was it that was so important to them? Um, take Robert Sim, for example. Mm. Uh, Defender in the I, 70s. Yeah, I'm, I'm, he's into the 70s now, mm. and I'm the team manager for Debs for Life. Mm. Yeah, it's a social game, and you know what? Every time, he's the earliest player to arrive before the game. And when I was with national team with Fandi and Malik and Kadil, uh, David Lee, I tell you what, they will be the one, 15 minutes before training start, they will be there. And after training, sometime David will say, Hey, Colin, throw me some balls. I need to, you know, get myself. That's after training. So this is a different... I, I'm not sure about now because I'm, I'm not fair. It's not fair for me to say now because I'm not involved yeah. much at this I'll level. get Shasi to comment on that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You do the part. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but I feel that the destruction is also a problem. You know, those days, it's very focused. 
you know, football, go home, sleep, or work part-time. You know, after football, they can do a part-time job, you know. So these days, I think it's getting very tough uh, to ask them to be like the past. Uh, I would say don't, don't compare, and we have to find a solution. Yeah. But those days, it's a lot about here. Yeah. Even myself, I mean, uh, when I was first appointed, Walk in the national stadium. As in assistant team manager. Assistant team manager yeah. Patrick Ang was there. Mm. I cried. <laughs> okay. You know how I started? I started at eleven years old when I because I got no money, in order to walk into National Stadium, I actually sell drinks curry pop kuechi there. At the National Stadium. At the National Stadium, the old Kalang Stadium. And you know what? The first first incident was that after half time, the, the water is supposed to sell. The, the ice was all melt, melted. Mm. I returned back to the lady, the lady said, hey, Atiyah, don't waste my time, you know. Uh, I'll give you 50 cents after that, I take a bus back. That was the time that I want to watch football. Then I become a stadium announcer. Mm. Then that moment when I sat next to Patrick Ang, I cried. I said, wow, what a journey. Okay. <laughs> Shasi, you presently work with uh, several teenagers as a, as a coach currently. Journey speaking, do you agree that some of the players of today uh, I mean, they could be professional players even. Uh, are they more concerned with the glitz and the glamour? Or their social media following as opposed to practicing, like you said, you know, coming earlier, practicing after training? You have to be careful, huh? Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. Uh, he works with a, no, yeah. a wide range of uh, uh, teenagers. Okay, I, I have to be fair and, and frank as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I cringe sometimes, uh, not, not at you, mm. but when certain People say that you know in those days, in 1960s, in 1950s, mm. you know they, they, they played for the badge and they played, they, they sing the national anthem and, and mm, you know mm, and mm. so on and so forth. Because I think it's unfair to the players of today. Yeah. I don't think they want to lose games. I don't think they want to stand there as the national anthem is being played, mm. that they don't wear the badge. Proudly, yeah. you know, I I think it's a little bit unfair when, when certain people say that I, I just cringe. You know, I, I it's it's a little bit unfair to the players of today. Mm. Now going back to the social media and, and things like that. Now listen, again. Back then, if you want to talk about nineteen forties and 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 what have you, mm. if it, back then they had social media, they had handphones and all, I bet you these players will be using them, yeah. the social media. Mm. All right, so we need to snap out of this and yes. move forward. You know, social media will be there, Facebook will be there, Instagram will be there. I use Instagram every day, you use Instagram every day, mm -hmm. uh, we use Facebook every day. Everyone is using it. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, we've got a responsibility. The players have got responsibility. When you wear the badge, you use it responsibly. Uh, responsibly. You don't see Harris Harun going out naked and posting it on, on Instagram, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. So it's about education. You see all the best players in the world. They don't go out on Instagram and do silly stuff, except if you are Paul Pogba. Yeah. Uh, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> all right? but, but seriously, right? So we got to move on. You know, I, I don't care if uh, Bayhaki goes out there and combs his hair and posts it on Instagram. If he goes out there and scores the goals the next day, yeah. right? So be it. Yeah. So social media will be there. It is about how you use them and we got to educate these players. Right, you do. You don't go out doing silly stuff and then posting, you know. And I think it is about the education. You got to educate these players, right? Right from the again. I am always like uh, I always like I always like to go down right. Mm. So you can educate players when they are ten years old. I I'm sure there are ten year old uh, players out there using Facebook. I'm sure, I know twelve year old. You need to educate them, you know, about the about the 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 harm of using social media and, and stuff like that. So uh, I've got nothing against players on, on social media because I use them personally, so I don't have any problems. But you know, as long they, as they deliver. Deliver and they're going yeah. to use it responsibly as well. They need to know what is right and wrong. Yeah. You know, and what example, one perfect example is Harris Exactly, Captain. But it, so the sacrifices of being a professional soccer player is actually extreme today. Uh, because of the demands of the game, yeah. it's just gone up. Yeah. You know, I, I here's a, here, Tales of yesterday year, right? Mm -hmm. So everyone knows Raja Gopal used to have to drink before mm -hmm. he plays a game, right? Mm -hmm. And he drank quite seriously, but it's okay. You know, that was the demands of the game at this time. Mm -hmm. um, today's game is completely different. And the sacrifices a professional elite soccer player, if you want to be a really good soccer player, oh, you've got to sacrifice tremendous. This includes sleep. It, it, Tells you, no one will tell you differently, right? In every professional soccer club in Europe, they monitor your sleep. 
you actually wear a band or whatever and you log it in every day wow. okay. you are supposed to eat properly right no motabak mi goreng nasi don't have you eat according to a particular because you need to keep a particular body mass right and body shape so obviously no nightlife as well right very very little nightlife mm. if you go nightlife you have another problem you get photographed yeah. you also have a problem right mm. they don't drink right and, and i tell you honestly i mean i i, I follow liverpool you know right um, mm. there's a local pub at the corner mm. no liverpool players ever gone there because they don't drink and Arsene Wenger was the first to introduce that if you remember Tony Adams had a drinking problem mm. yeah. right so football has changed you need to practice every day Ronaldo on his off days and holidays still does the gym and run because he's so worried about losing the edge that is the kind of dedication you need to be a soccer player discipline and dedication and to the extent I feel sorry at one time your favorite team Arsenal was visiting Indonesia and I was there and I was invited you know, to interact with the players. The players are robots. The 17, 18 year olds are told to say very little when they interact with the crowd. You know how you're doing? It's fine, great, nice of you to be here. The words are scripted <laughs> because you don't want it to appear in social media elsewhere and you want to have a persona that comes across that you're very nice to the fans, right? They're told where to go, where to eat, what to do. It's a military life. A soccer player's life is a military life, right? That's the sacrifice you make. Is it worth it? You have to determine for yourself. Um, you've been told about the 10,000 hour rule, mm. right? Before you get good at something, you must practice that skill for 10,000 hours. It translates to two, 20 hours a week for 10 years, right? Mm. You think about whether we actually dedicate 20 hours a week to that. That's something else I'm looking at because I want to give an opportunity for our youngsters who say, I want to do this, to say, let's go through this. Because we will have much better players. Just to, you know, I, I talk about defending our players, but what I can't defend is when they, they speak about it because it's a sacrifice. Let's face, let's face it's it, a it's a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And when they go out and say, hey, it's a sacrifice, you know, I, I have to, what, do you, what did you expect? You know, mm -hmm. you have to sacrifice. So. If you want to do that, if you want to be a footballer, a professional footballer, playing for the national team, and you, earning and, the and earning bucks. the big bucks, yeah. get prepared to be, uh, to be you know, or, or pe people being critical of them, yeah. or obviously not being vulgar at them or whatever. But they they got to take it and accept it and move on and be a better player or whatever. Because, like you said, it's a sacrifice. You are out there in the media twenty four seven. The know, public eye. Just something wrong you do and that's it. You're gone. Raja, but uh, just to come back yeah. to the tactics yeah, yeah, yeah. again in soccer. So the demands are so high. Uh, actually, some people don't really understand how, how much the game has gone. And as average viewer, just go try this. An average number of sprint, and hard sprint is about 25 kilometers hour, which means basically you go all out. Huh? Mm. Yeah. The average number of sprint a Premier League player does is about 65. Okay. Assuming, right, that, that basically over 90 minutes, every one and a half minute, he's sprinting full throttle for 20 meters. Mm. Try that at home. You won't last one half. <laughs> that is the demand of soccer today. Our players do our 20 to 30. Half. Right? It shows you that even the pace of soccer in Asia is far lower than the Premier League. Right? So if you want to compete at the top level, this is not your standard. You've got to double what you do. Just one more question on uh, mindsets. Bernard, the FAS are the guardians and in charge of the national teams at the various age groups. Mm -hmm and uh, with strict policies already in place, why do you reckon we still have players who are willing to risk punishment when they are, end up doing, you know, we talked about a few seconds, doing silly things like missing training, smoking, breaking curfew. I mean, is it time for the FAS to impose stricter punishments such as, you know, suspended from playing for 12 to 18 months or three years suspension where it really hits, uh, you know, and hurts the most for the culprit, what do you reckon? So you are right. Uh, I think what we want to do is to have a culture that if you, if you are in a national team and you are taking public funding to help you to be the best you can be, you have a duty to repay that with your best effort. And your best effort means you're disciplined about it. right? Um, two years ago, when we came to the council, the first one, we imposed a no smoking. So if you smoke, you drop there. No, no doubt. Three strikes, you're out here. Right? But you're dropped straight the first time, and then second time, you know, basically the increased money, but three strikes you're out. And we started to impose that. Um, I can't explain, I, we do want to uh, have a, a much 
more stringent way of managing the players. Um, so over the sea games, obviously you're you're raising the sea games. It is a disappointment to us. Uh, I will just say that the boys are young, right? Uh, they are mischievous at this age. Um, they will learn from this. We are looking to pay act, take action uh, to make sure that we send a strong signal that you mustn't abuse the trust that the public has given to you, uh, and we'll take it from there. But it is something of a concern. Um, but obviously, our actions will indicate the direction that we want to take. Okay. Last last question. Setting realistic targets and goals. You know, mm-hmm. national football. I mean, we talked about ways, but whether we should have a national football agenda. I think just now you you, you alluded to that. So should the national football targets ought to be like a SEA Games gold medal? Our very first gold medal in the history of the Games, maybe you set it in 2025, three games from now, or reaching the final 16 of the Asian Cup 2027. We haven't reached the final 16 at all. Rather than perhaps qualifying to play in the 2034 FIFA World Cup. So the question is, should we set short-term targets to achieve and seek the support of Singaporeans as opposed to a fantasy-like idea of co-hosting with three or four other neighbouring countries in 2034? I, I think it's dangerous if we do it the short term. Uh, you know, World Cup level is the highest in football. Yep. We can be a co-host. We play in one of the group. But if we got trash throughout, mm. it would take us many, many years to bring us back again. Because everybody around the world will understand, oh, yeah, Singapore. That's what they are. Go ahead, Daniel. You know, mm. I think we, we have to know what is long term and short term. I'd rather the money invest in all the youth. Mm. Bring back the Lion City Cup. Mm. You know, bring back the Malayan Cup. You know, these are the tournaments that bond us together. Mm. You know, okay, fine players. We talk about majority, minority, but the fans. The the year that Sundram won the Malaysia Cup. The, with the young the, the uh, 2011 or 12 yeah. Yeah, yeah. but you see the fans in the stadium mm. that, that's Singapore yeah. he won the league yeah he won the yeah. league yeah. yeah so what, what I'm trying to say here is basically um, let's let's be realistic let's be real you know uh, don't, don't, don't try to say okay we co-host we can have a chance to I mean to be co-host to bid for it you have to spend millions of dollars a- am I right you have to spend yeah. a lot of money just to be for it to say I'm here to present mm. you something. Are we ready for it? Mm. This money can we use it? Sorry to say, I mean I like to to support all the Singapore coaches. Can we groom them? Can we help them send them with, with a proper system? Now what you say? Okay, this is our agenda. This is where we're supposed to do. This is what we need to do. Sasi A B C D E twelve coaches. Let's go. Mm. That's how the J League started too. They sent administrator to Germany, to England, to Bundesliga, to study one year. And they do. They did a day, weekly report sent back to Japan FA. This is how the league is run. Mm. I think I would rather invest money in this way. At least everybody in Singapore, I mean, those who love football, have an opportunity. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Long term. Mm. Shall I see? Short term target, long term target, fantasy. What, what, what is the 2034 World Cup? No, 2034. No, I, I, if you're talking about the co-hosting and stuff, uh, do we even have the, the, the infrastructure to do it? But, but that, that's yeah, something, that's, yeah. let's put that aside. But uh, I mean, should we set uh, like a short-term target and really go out? All we, we should have short-term targets and then leading on to the main one, obviously, yeah. right? And, and this is what I feel personally, and again, again nothing against FA and the S League and what have you. I just feel that we are so big on a goal. It can be a small goal, it could be a big goal. You know, we are so big on that, that, that KPI and, and, and what have you. Mm. you know, but again, Bernard will say I'm wrong, that there are no plans in between to get there. Right? What are the plans? What are those specific plans? Mm. Now, and, and when there are plans set out to, to reach that goal, everybody below that has got to be pulling and pushing in the same direction. Mm. You know, from schools to clubs to the Everyone, Community every everything. every single one, stakeholders, fans, and everyone, the coaches and, and what have you, they've got to be pulling and pushing in the same direction to get there, you know. And I think that is what it is. It is tr- tremendously lacking here in, in 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 Singapore. And and again, Bernard will correct me if I'm wrong, and obviously he will. But that that's my 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 opinion. And just just I don't know. 
Uh, how long has our TD been here? Six months? Eight, mm-hmm. Six to eight months, I don't, I'm roughly. You know, yeah. and we, we as a nation, we don't know what are his plans in terms of, you know, being yeah. a technical director and what is happening. You know, so what are the plans to get there? If there is a 2034 goal, what are the plans? Okay. So, um, so you have to have a philosophy of football again. Uh, I always go for the long term because I believe that the trans- transformation of a country in, in football system is long term goal. Um, so Germany, a great example, 2001, they won the World mm. Cup again, you know, about 15, 16 mm. years later. Mm. Uh, Qatar wanted to qualify and be Asian champions and wanted to, to obviously participate in the World Cup 2022 with a credible squad, 15 years. Mm. Right? And the reason for this is the philosophy starts with if you want to build a great national team, you've got to start with kids. Right? I think we'll plan for three workers, but then they are already teenagers. Mm. I've missed the kids. If I want to say that this is the generation from here on, I take them from kids and I bring them to adulthood, 14, 15 years mm. before they become a national player. A six year old will be 29 or 20, right? A, a 10 year old will be around you know, 24, 25. That's the kind of time frame we're looking at. Mm. So go 2034, this is my own marketing, is about kids. It's about focusing to say, this is the generation that we want to get it right. We give them experience of 6 to 12, and then when they become 12, or maybe 10 years old, 11, they go on a lead pathway where they have to commit to this 20 hours a week. Where we have to tell them, or give them coaches that are of a standard, right? They can do the things we talked about earlier on, pass the ball flat, take the ball first time and shoot at the goal, you know, get into position because you, it's automatically drilled in you over the last five, six years. Mm. Then put them into the SEA Games squad, get into the Asian Cup and the World Cup. Mm. But that's the generation we're looking at. It doesn't mean that the generation won't benefit, but we will actually get the system right from here on. So I think 2034 is a great goal. I think it's creating a football culture. Mm. What Jurgen Klopp did, he went in, it was given time to understand the culture of Liverpool FC, the fans, the staff, the, 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 the players. So slowly he took time to blend. I think having a goal, I definitely support. But how, how are we going to do it? You know, do we have... Especially when we didn't achieve the first goal, goal 2010. Mm. So there's a lot of scepticism around at the moment. Uh, well... Even you're the best player, even you do something right, there's still people criticize you. So let, let's not worry about how people criticize us. It's, I should worry that, can I get this plan executed? Who are the people that, you know, just like the movie 300. I don't need 30,000, I need 300 people to fight. Who are the 300? Do I have the 300? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. If I don't have, I mean, if I have, of course, yeah. we can go further. But, but. That's very, one thing very important. Let's win at the youth level first. Look at Vietnam, who won the ni- under-19 in Asia, or under-21 Asia, they went to the final. And look at their national team now. We have to start winning from the youth team. You and know? they just won the SEA Games gold medal. For yeah. the first time in 30 years. Yeah. yeah, we have to start from there. And, and I, I mean, I love children, I have four. And I tell you what, we have to, those players that play for us, we have to treat them like our children. We have to let them know that we are serious, we are sincere and we love them and we want to see them to excel somewhere. And not just punishing them, pushing them. It, it's easy to punish. Mm. But you know what? You only create fear factor. If they understand, they learn. If, I, if my own son play in this football team, he make a mistake. Mm. Is it true? Just punishment. Just say my son is inside. I will want to give him a chance. Mm. I want to explain to him, let him learn. Because any man that learn from mistake and become a better man, I tell you what, he will never go wrong. Mm. Yeah, that, that's my point. Mm. Mm. Okay, we've come to the end of uh, this very. So before you go to the end, uh, I must yeah. say oh, one, yeah. one Liverpool thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the biggest changes that I've had, you know, in my time in soccer was the movement from a style of, to, to give towards a style of play. Yeah. The unique thing about Jurgen Klopp and Pep Guardiola is they have a philosophy of play. They don't look at the players and say, you know, how do I win with this players? They say, this is the style I want to play. And they go into the club and they implement it. Mm. And they move the players that can't do it and bring in players that can. Mm. And they do it throughout the whole club. 
they do it at the first senior team level, they do it at the youth squad level, so that anybody coming in understands this is what you need to do. It is high pressing, high energy, and it's football at the top level. Guardiola and, and Klopp does it. Mm. Not many managers do this. Mm. Many managers go on and do exactly what was before, right? I want to win, this is the set of players, I'll do whatever it takes to win. But over the long term, the philosophy trumps everything. Right? Which he shows you. He didn't win anything in his first season, he didn't win anything. The philosophy trumps everything. Mm. And uh, since it's the day after the FA Cup third round, right? Mm. Mm. right? The fact that the young boys from Liverpool could play the same thing against a senior Everton squad and win, least testimony. That even with an inexperienced squad, if you play a certain style and have that philosophy running through the club, you can achieve great things. We'll just come to English football uh, very quickly, but uh, just we'll touch on just one last question about Singapore football. It's the start of a new, new decade. Very, very briefly, two things you'd like to see change or remain in Singapore football. I think I hope that we can bring back the uh, tournaments that we used to have. Okay. Lion City Cup, the Lion Cup. Okay. Uh, get a sponsor. We used to have Philip International, where okay. we got intermediate team. Mm. Okay. So that's yeah. one. That's one. Second one, I hope. Uh, the club chairman, or the professional club chairman, can put their ego and pride aside and sit down for the sake of Singapore football. I know it's not. It's going to be very difficult. Some of them are so successful in their business, in their career, so they say, this is my blueprint. But I think this is a national agenda. If, if you really want to be serious about football, let's sit down and let's say, hey guys, can we get it right this way? I, I think this is what we are as a Singapore citizen, as a Singapore fan, this is what I'm looking forward for a day this thing happened. Okay. Jesse? Uh, I, I will speak purely based on f footballing uh, yeah. you know, aspect. I would love to see the, the quality of coaching improve, especially at ground, ground level. You know, I think I've seen many good coaches and I've seen many bad ones as well. Mm. And again, subjective. But in my opinion, I think it can be improved. And if you want to get there, we're talking about passing right, crossing right, hitting right, passing it on the ground. It's all about the coaches. Yeah, but first of all, coaches are already AFC A license holders. These are certs. Certs. These okay. are certs, right? Yeah. I can have a pro diploma and I'm still out of a job. Okay. I, I still can't do it, right? So, so what I'm saying is the quality of coaching has got to be top notch to get there, you know, and we're talking about the goal and whatever goals that we have. Mm. To get there, the quality of coaching has got to improve. And uh, number two, something that I would love to see, uh, like-minded Singapore football people, footballing people coming together, pushing and pulling in all the same directions and to get us there. The various stakeholders. Yeah. Okay, join it. Okay, just to follow up one thing, uh, just Shashi to just underline the coaching. So I, I tell you another story. Uh. Mm. I watched the finals of the B division. Right, uh, this uh, last year. Last year, yeah. right, and uh, it was extremely telling. Right, the players were very enthusiastic, loved to play. Mm. Right, but they didn't pass it on the ground. They hit it long. They put it to their fastest and quickest player, who then ran and scored the goal. Right, mm. Mm. and I looked at you know the the TD right and says what's going on right because if we want to start of play we better start from secondary school. And the truth is, it's very difficult because the coaches are paid to win. Mm. And you know at a young level, right, there will always be two or three players that are outstanding, they are faster, they can shoot. So just give the ball to them and they'll do the rest. Yeah. But this book, even now, when you go to the professional level, yeah. right, then the question is what has the players learned? Nothing. Right? So winning at the youth level is not the most important thing. It's learning a style and developing the technical skill. Right? It's the mm. most important thing. How do we get that? How do we get that when the coach is actually paid if whether he won? If not, I'm going to change the coach. Mm. That must stop. Okay. That must stop. My wish, mm. two things, that we have Go 2034 accepted as a long-term plan. And this means stakeholders have to come on board and that's the difficult part. Like I mentioned to you, FAS has no regulatory or authoritative power. We only have the power of influence. Mm. And I'm hoping to get that as a blueprint for us for the next 10 to 15 years with commitment, long-term commitment. Once we have that, I want our kids to love the game, to play the game, and to be coached in a way that will make them world champions. Okay. 
Can I have one more wish? <laughs> okay. one more wish? <laughs> I wish Singapore media mm. covers Singapore football well. Because I think uh, this is one part that our players are not feeling it, you know. Yeah, I, I remember those days, football, uh, Singapore football is every day on the back of Straits Time, mm. the new paper. You know, but these days uh, it seems that we have to pay them before they start writing. And I think this is wrong. I hope, you know, for the sake of Singapore football again, let's come together. Mm. And European football has taken over the, the, most of the pages. Yeah, pride again. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, this was meant to be a, a 60 minute show. It's gone up to about almost 90 minutes. When you talk about Singapore football, it's, it is a never ending topic. Uh, thank you very much for your heartfelt and brutally honest comments. Colin Chi, Shasi Kumar, Bernard Tan, thank you very much for coming on board uh, our first episode of uh, the new decade and uh, for, you know, let's hope for the very best for Singapore football and uh, we'll see what, what, what happens. I mean, I think this year we are taking part in the Suzuki Cup at the end of the year, so let's, gonna, let's see what Coach uh, Yoshida can do with the Lions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Shasi, thank you. Uh, Colin, Bernard Tan. Yeah, all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And that was a very lively and entertaining and hopefully a very impactful edition of Singapore Football on SG Sports Uncut. And if you have any comments about this show, feel free to drop us an email at sgsportsuncut at gmail.com. Till the next time, I'm Raj Kumar. Bye for now.